So bismillahirrahmanirrahim ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulil kareem amma ba'd so today we will discuss i think the events that led to the the shahada of Hussein the grandson of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we will talk about why this is an important subject i think many people in the uh, western audience of muslims uh don't necessarily i think appreciate this aspect of history and then inshallah ta'ala if allah wills then we'll show the the this symbol of this shahada how this relates to the uh, the coming of imam mahdi and i think we're going to talk about the two prophets and uh, we will also talk about the status of the family of the Prophet Sallallahu which a lot of times what happens because of the Sunni Shia action reaction um, the Sunnis sometimes don't own you can say as much or proclaim as much uh, of the Ahlul Bayt the family of the Prophet even though we are in the forefront of that in terms of our history so I wanted to share that aspect too, if Allah wills. So Bismillah walhamdulillah. So <clears throat> very quickly, and then inshallah you can help me along with this. The Prophet came, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He worked hard, gathered the people, invited the people to Islam, formed a jama'ah, fought against the falsehood, and after some time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him victory. And that victory was, you can say, the purpose of the advent of the Prophet So when Sultan Nasr was completed, when the victory and the help of Allah comes, you will see people entering into Islam in crowds. So Allah tells the Prophet, so, you know, Allah is basically telling the Prophet that, you know, do istighfar and do tasbih of Allah and Allah is most forgiving. So this was a sign, you know, when the Prophet had the victory and he was in Mecca and now he's the crownless king of Arabia. And uh, uh, he now realizes, as in some companions like Abkar, they realize that this means the end of our companionship with the Prophet ﷺ. Because his mission had been accomplished and he now established practically for the world to see a system of life in which the property and the blood and the honor and the... Uh, and the life of human beings is sacred, right? We don't talk about human rights. We talk about sacred, sacred, the sacred. It's, it's, it's higher than rights. So the Prophet left us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Abu Bakr came. And what is important to know that when any system comes, then there's always counter-revolutions. And in this, Abu Bakr had to hold everything in place because he had to deal with all the fitnas that happened. Uh, people were not willing to give zakat. Many people were claiming prophethood. And he was in a very dangerous situation where now he's sending an army to the Roman Empire. Even though he had a, a khilafah of only uh, a very few years. Uh, but he accomplished a lot. But the real Khilafah, you can say that after the counter, countering the counter-revolution, really started with Omar in that sense, in the true sense. Because Abu Bakr uh, didn't let it fall. And it was going through an onslaught of uh, difficulties. And that's why Omar's Khilafah is very uh, bright, you can say, in Islamic history. Uh, because it was the it was a it was a true manifestation without the fitness, right? And Abu Bakr had said that if they're not going to pay zakat, 
Do they want to change the deen? And I'll relate this with Hussein. Mm -hmm. Right? Do you want to change the deen while I'm alive? Do you want to change Islam and the Islamic system, the Islamic uh, khilafa? So now, <clears throat> Omar becomes the khalifa, then Uthman becomes the khalifa. Uthman is khalifa for 12 years. And Uthman's Khalifa is just like Omar's Khilafa for the first 10 years. There was no issues in the Khilafa of Uthman till the last two years. Again, I don't want to go into the too many details, but just as Omar was killed, but Omar was killed by a non-Muslim, but Ali, uh, Uthman was killed by people who claimed to follow Islam. And by the way, Ali was also killed by people who claimed to follow Islam. And uh, what happened as a result is that the, the expanse of Islam created some enemies. So you could say the first onslaught of enemies happened in the time of Abu Bakr. False prophets, multiple false prophets, and Muslims within saying, we don't want to give zakat. And then after that, it was, you know, there were issues, but it was smooth sailing. The whole of Omar's Khilafah, the whole of Uthman's Khilafah. And because that had all been crushed, it took time for something new to come. So as you know, there were Jews in Medina. Some of them had converted to Islam and some perhaps had converted to Islam to hurt Islam. And uh, this is where, you know, even in the Hadith literature, we have to be careful about who is the narrators, right? And and uh, were these narrators influenced by who and so on and so forth? And that that whole knowledge is there. It's, it's preserved. And that's a separate issue. But anyway, Uthman is Khalifa and now there's a new uprising. And Uthman was a very, very, very modest modest yani i want to express this we all get a feeling of you know uh the rahma of abu bakr and the the uh ashaddu fi amrillahi umar the um. the most severe in the command of allah is umar right wa akthar haya uthman and the most modest of them was uthman what does modesty mean i think that when we say modesty Haya, even in the Muslim world, it's been reduced to mean certain types of clothings, or it's been reduced to mean like uh, a type of, you could say, modesty in terms of gender relationships and so on and so forth. But haya, in its real sense of the word, actually means a, a sensitivity a certain sensitivity to the other. This is, it's like Adam, right? It's like a certain respect. And so Uthman was the man of the highest level of sensitivity to uh, not having a claim for himself, right? Like, I'm shy of you. Like, how can I speak in front of you, for example? Istahi right? minnak. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm shy. You know, you, I respect you too much. I can't. I can't talk while you're here. You're my teacher, right? For example. So, haya is a certain sensitivity that's been lost in the modern age. People now don't even know what adab is, but it's a certain sensitivity where you're like, I'm no one, and this person, this other person, is someone, right? And so that sensitivity of his, that when these rebellions started and a large number of the companions of the Prophet had left to Hajj, and these people came into the city of Medina wanting to kill him, he was too shy to say, defend me. In that sense, right? Like, I have, like, why would, why is it, why would I ask them to defend me? The Muslims. So you have a leader who rules from the Oxus River close all the way to Spain. 
And there are people in his city who want to kill him, about 2,000. And he's like, and people are like, we want to send an army. Muawiyah is like, we want to send an army to protect you. And the Sahaba are like, we, let us stand up and fight. And very difficultly, very difficultly, very difficultly, right? Ali convinces Uthman to let have Hassan and Hussein guard your doors, right? And he's the, out of all the companions of the Prophet, he's the most modest in the sense of, like, you know, you come first. Like, you're, everyone's first, I'm last, right? And he's the, he's the, the, the aristocrat monk, right? Like, when they went into the city, and I'm sorry I'm talking about Uthman so much, but, I mean, really, Muslims need to appreciate Not at all, Sheikh. Absolutely, yes. And, and remember, he's for part of Ahlul Bayt, right? He's part of Ahlul Bayt. He married two, two of the Prophet's daughters. And when his first daughter passed away, and the Prophet saw how sad Uthman was, because they used to say Uthman and Ruqayya are the, are, the, are the most beautiful couple. Meaning the Prophet's daughter and Uthman is the most beautiful couple. There's a narration that one of the companions the Prophet saw Uthman and Ruqayya sitting together. And this is where he, he said this is like the most, it was like the ideal couple, right? The ideal young couple. And Uthman's extremely, extremely rich. And they didn't have access to water, the Muslims, in their portion so he bought a well right he bought a well for the muslims to drink from and now when these 2000 people come in it's like i mean to give it a modern example of what uthman did is let's say there's a mob of 50000 people that comes into the washington dc and they're saying we're going to go straight into the white house and the president is so modest that he says to all his security guards stand down don't do anything. In fact, I'm firing you all. If they come into the White House and kill me, that's you You take the responsibility at that time. But I'm not going to spill blood in this sacred land of Medina for Uthman. I'm not going to spill blood. I'm not going to be the cause. I'm too. He was too shy to do that, right? And so, I mean, like, extraordinary human being for the amount of wealth he had versus what he was willing to give up right he was like i'll be like the second son of adam you extend your hands to me i will not fight back you kill me i won't kill you and so that's uthman in terms of his rank remember that the quran when it says yadullahi fawqa aydihim allah's hand is on top of their hand that included the hand of uthman in the hand of the Prophet by himself. Right? So the Prophet took his hand and said, this is the hand of Uthman. Because he's not here, I'm giving bayah on his behalf. Which also shows, by the way, that the rumor that he had died, the Prophet knew somehow that he had not died, and therefore he said, I'm giving bayah on behalf of Uthman. So, his shyness in some ways, you can say it's not it's not proper adab to say something like this about a companion of the Prophet, but his shyness killed him. His his complete modest. I mean, you you're an, you're you're a, a crownless king, like the Prophet was a crownless he crownless king. He added to you know, and and he is in Medina, and there's a mob there that wants to kill him, and he's an old man. And I mean, this, this story is very long, so I don't want to spend too much time, but I want Muslims to appreciate Uthman. You know, I'll share with you something. Dr. Saab, rahmatullah Dr. Saab, used to say that whenever I talk about Uthman, it always rains. He Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's raining right now outside my house. The last time I talked about Uthman was at the Islamic school I teach. Wallahi, it rained that day. And I told the kids, it might rain. 
I don't know, because the sky cries over people like this. Anyway, Allah knows best. <clears throat> so, long story short, they go over the wall, they martyr him, they kill him, they make him shaheed while he was reading the Quran. Now, in that situation, because I want to not talk too much, you know, Ali was forced to take the Khilafah. If you may remember the uh, the shura that Umar had made that from which Uthman was the Khalifa, Ali was number two in there. But anyway, these mobs that came in, they were also saying, oh, Uthman is no good. Ali should be the Khalifa. So in this crisis situation where people are still in Hajj and in that crisis situation, rather than somebody from this mob taking over further, the bay'ah was given to Ali radiallahu anh, just very quickly to give some sense of control and sensibility to the ummah at that time. Now, Ali wanted to find out who were the perpetrators of these events. Who were they? Because these people had a mask around their heads. They weren't easily identifiable. And uh, they were hiding, you can say, amongst the masses. So one thing Ali did was he moved the Darul Khilafah from Medina to Kufa. But many companions of the Prophet were like, one month has gone by, two months have gone by, three months have gone by. Why are you not taking any steps towards Meaning you should, we can, we don't see it today, but from their perspective, Uthman was their Khalifa for 12 years. The one who married two of the Prophet's daughters. This is not just somebody that just got killed and the Sahaba were going to be like, okay, that's okay. Don't, let's move on. They were, this was, I think in some ways after the passing away of the Prophet, this hit them harder. The death of Uthman hit them harder in some ways more than the death of uh, Abu Bakr and Omar in some ways. Meaning the reaction that we see from the companions themselves was such that the it really shook them that how this mob just came into Medina and just killed him and like it was like shocking. I think it was the first major traumatic shock and the other thing that if you don't mind before we talk about the real topic that is very not think, at all sheikh it's always a pleasure to listen to you no and and i want you to you know please uh you know uh, share with me your thoughts uh I, i'll say this and i'll let you say something and so but one of the differences between omar and uthman was omar would not let the sahaba leave medina It was his that the jama'ah that the Prophet made has to stay in Medina. He can't leave without my permission. But when Uthman became the Khalifa, he's like, you're free. I'm not going to stop you from... And so the Sahaba, they went all the way to China and all the way to different parts of the Muslim world. And, you know, so that jama'ah, that jama'ah the Prophet had established, it's that core group had begun to vanish. And the second difference between Umar and Uthman was a fiqhi difference in jurisprudence. Umar always looked at, this, at the people as who were the Badris, who were the people who gave bayah in Bayt al-Ridwan in Hudaybiyah, who were the people who became Muslim before Fatul Makkah, who became Muslim after. Like he had the Ashram Mubashar on the top and then like this there was a Tartib and he gave preference to everything based upon this. Uthman disagreed with this. Hey, once you're Muslim, you're Muslim, you're my Muslim brother. I'm not going to make a difference, distinguish between the Badri and just somebody who became Muslim yesterday. I'm not going to stop you from leaving. I'm not going to give the Sahaba, in other words, a special status from other Muslims. Because that meant he would give himself a special status. And he was not going to do that. He felt we're all Muslims, okay? These two things indirectly because of his shyness weakened the 
central jama'ah or command that the Prophet had created. Because now the Sahaba had left. The Sahaba had left. And now he was relying on the people around him at that time based upon whatever he had. <clears throat> Do you have any comments so far? Uh, absolutely, Sheikh, the way you started this talk that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he established the command of Allah on this land. And there is a sahih prophetic tradition, very unambiguous, very unambiguous. And it is absolutely impossible to refute it because it reaches the daraja of tawatur, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin ba'di. Now, this is the part most of the people miss. The Prophet ﷺ said, it is fard on you to take my sunnah, <coughs> to, hold on, to hold on to my sunnah and the sunnah of my four caliphates. Ar-Rashidin al-Mahdiyin abadi. Addu alayha bin nawajiz. Hold on to it with your molar teeth which is very significant. Even if the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have said this, wouldn't have added this, it would have still been a decree from the Prophet ﷺ. And the hukm shari'i is whenever there is an amr, a degree from the Prophet ﷺ, it's at least wajib. Even if in some cases, if, if it is not fard, it is at least wajib. But still, the Prophet ﷺ added, Addu alayha bin nawajiz. So that tells us that that was the golden period of Islam. And the system of Khilafah, people don't understand it, especially my youth of today doesn't understand it much. It is what is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, Amruhum shura bainahum. And it is khilafa what is based upon that. And it is the decree of the Prophet ﷺ. It is the nizam of Islam. It is the system of Islam, not democracy, not any other political or social or economical system. This is the system of Islam. And these four caliphates, al-Rashidin, al-Mahdiyin, the khulafa al-Rashid, these were the best examples of political system of Islam and the way it was established on earth. And you're very right, Sheikh, that uh, Azad Abu Bakr, anhu, when he became Khalifa, he was like, you know, he, most of his time was spent in just correcting some of the mistakes, some of the problems that the Muslims were having after the death of the Prophet wasallam. It was truly Umar ibn al-Khattab that found that golden era and golden period of Islam and really conquered, like conquered the world, basically. He conquered the world. And Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, subhanallah, you're talking about this. I've heard Dr. Saab talk about this as well, and uh, also other of my teachers. The concept of modesty, the humility, subhanallah. It was, uh, it was something that uh, is associated with him from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a very modest, very humble guy. Like you said, he said, defend me, who am I? I'm a nobody. Why would people come and defend me? Why would they spend resources on defending somebody like me? Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Although, Sheikh, I would uh, say that my knowledge of, of uh, tariq, of uh, history, obviously, is not at par with you, with you so you are a, at a better <coughs> level, level of analyzing this. But I do feel that maybe it wasn't as much as the modesty of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu vis-a-vis -vis the political agendas of, uh, you know, some of the people there who were trying from, I think, from the period of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and they finally found some uh, points that they could exploit finally and, and uh, make a political stand there. And so, yeah, he was killed. And then the way Hazrat Ali Karram Allah Wajhul Kareem, like you said uh, very rightly, the way he uh, took the bay'ah in those times of turmoil, his khilafah was never really uh, at par with the previous three caliphates in that sense. He was never able to establish it the way it was established in the first three uh, caliphates era. 
Yeah, mashallah. So, um, and so now the um the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Uthman oh, is is killed, his shaheed. Ali becomes the Khalifa, and he's trying to bring back what was. But again, Ali is dealing with so many problems also, right? And one thing that I think that becomes very important here to discuss is that is the structure more important or the people in that structure? In stru is the structure you have of Khilafah? Is the structure more important or the people in the structure more important? Right? So I think that both of these are important, but you can't have the ideal system one without the other, right? You got to have certain level of people, certain level of piety with a certain type of structure of command. And so Ali is trying to reestablish the Khilafah. He moves the Darul Khilafah to Kufa. And uh, again, but now he's dealing with... and. I guess there's some wisdom in this, but now he's dealing with the Khawarij, people that are willing to kill other Muslims. Uh, he's dealing with the party that's saying kill for Uthman uh, or find the killers of Uthman, sorry, find the person who perpetrated this. And it's, and I was, say, I was trying to say that it was such a big deal to see a caliph killed like that, that and they wanted a sense of this, like, we are hurt and we want justice. That even Aisha and Zubair and Talha and many companions of the Prophet were asking Ali, what's taking so long? What's taking so long? And this kind of like conflict that was created in the Muslim world, a type of quasi-civil war, you can say, type scenario. This created a situation that was made the Khilafah very difficult for Ali on the one side. But it also created a situation which, again, others then now continued to exploit from the time of Uthman. And now people are at odds with Ali. And had it not been for the clear statements of the Prophet indicating so that Ali much. is on the right, it would have been a very confusing thing for us. Right. And again, I say this because if you remove the traditions of the prophet, you get a totally very confusing picture. It's only with the sayings of the prophet and his guidance that, uh, for example, I'm not going to go into this, but the group that kills Am Ammar bin Yusuf, uh, uh, Ammar, Ammar bin Yasir. Right. That is the party that is the Baghi, the, the ones that are doing transgression. Meaning, the result was that Ali's party is the one that's on the truth. And this makes political sense too, because you can't just have your governor start fighting with you. The governor would be on the wrong if you're under a state. Anyway. <clears throat> Sheikh, just a quick point to this. Uh, without the Hadith literature, you have no history. H how are we going to determine all of the, the, the things that you have talked about? How much have you taken just from the Maghazi and how much have you taken from the Hadith? 80% mm. of the things that you have just said, in fact, I would say 90%, you've taken from the canon of Hadith, right? Yes. You didn't go to Tariq ibn Kathir or Tariq ibn Khuldun. You went to Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and Saha Sitta, right? Mm. That is how you know about the, the Haya of Uthman, uh, radiallahu anhu. That is how you know about those incidents that you talked about. That is how you know about this tariq. I mean, it would be naive to say, you know, let's just do away with the with the canon of Hadith and uh, we'll know everything about the history of Islam. It doesn't work that way. Just a quick point. Yeah, and, and you know, the... Um... This is, we'll come to this, but this is a very, very important point because uh, remember we were watching that roundtable discussion with Dr. Saab, Dr. Saab. Yes, yes, China, yes. Right? The question then becomes then, where does Islam start and where does Islam, like what is Islam historically speaking, right? And uh, maybe I'll show that clip towards the end and we can maybe discuss it too after we talk about Hussein and the whole discussion we want to have today. But the, point he made is that the prophet 
till the Khilafat al Rashidah. That is Islam. That is the normative classical Islam. You cannot run away from your legacy of Khilafah. Forever and ever, the mirror of that Khilafah is by which we will look at our faces as a people in any time of history. Right? And so I, I think that it's, you know, people that want to kind of like do away with Khilafah or pretend we can have an Islam without Khilafah don't realize that you can't run from your history. It's like trying to run from yourself. Absolutely. This this whole conundrum about, you know, the tradition and there are concoctions and manipulations and interpolations in the tradition. If you have counterfeit gold or counterfeit currency, you don't stop trading in that, right? If you have counterfeit gold, it's not like one day you'll wake up and say, oh, because there is counterfeit gold on the market, I'm not going to buy any more gold. No, what you do is you have certain tools invented to ascertain that this Gold is the proper one, the authentic one, and this gold is inauthentic, a counterfeit. This is what has been done by the ulama for the hadith as well. Yes. So now <clears throat> Ali becomes the Khalifa and he deals with the fitans at his time. Ali is again killed by a Muslim, which is another big shock. Now Hassan becomes the Khalifa radiallahu an, and he's the wow. fifth Khalifa, really. And because the 30 years the Prophet mentioned only come to an end with the Khilafah of Hassan radiallahu So his six months as a Khalifa is also significant in this way. And another example of a person who is completely like not in la yuriduna aluwan fil They don't want power in the world. This was not their, you know, uh, intent and so he sees an opportunity to make peace in the Muslim world he makes peace with Muawiyah radiallahu an. he makes peace with him and so the whole Muslim world becomes one again and I guess one of the lessons in here is that you know even at the level of Khilafah if you're pious even then dunya can backstab you. You know, in a way, right? But anyway, that's... that's. Now, Hassan becomes Khalifa. Hassan gets poisoned. The grandson of the Prophet gets poisoned. And the reason he gets poisoned is because once there was peace, there was a chance that certain people that had started all of this conundrum and this fitna and this chaos in the Muslim world that they would be discovered. Because now that there's peace, there can be talks and they would be discovered. So they needed to get rid of Hassan. So they poisoned Hassan radiallahu anh. Now, Muawiyah is the Khalifa. But he's not Khilafat khilaf, khilaf, He's not a... Yes, in inverted commas. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's, he's not a Khilafat al-Rashida, right? Yeah. And the Sahaba told him one of the one of the companions of the Prophet said that we don't consider you Khilafat al Rashida, meaning and, and he was accepting of this. And at least he was he couldn't say much, let's say. Now, the point I want to make here is that Muawiyah, when he made his peace agreement with Hussein, sorry, Hassan. He said, Hassan's condition was that you will not nominate someone after you. You will let the Muslims choose who is the next Khalifa. Exactly, that you will not turn this into hereditary kingship. Now, Muawiyah, after the death of Hassan, okay. he no nominated his son as the Khalifa. Now, let me give you the logic behind that. But now we know that Islam itself is coming to, meaning the normative, prophetic, minhaj, khilafa ala minhaj al nabuwa would be in jeopardy if after Muawiyah, the next khalifa was his son. Meaning this was not something that would be very um, good, positive. Some people can argue 
that this happened in stages. And I'll give you an example. Some people were trying to nominate the son of Umar to be the Khalifa at one time. And then after Ali radiallahu anh, Hassan became the Khalifa, even though Ali didn't nominate him, they said, we want Hassan to be the Khalifa. And Ali said, I'm not going to oppose it. You know, whatever you guys cho choose. So the son of Ali became the Khalifa. But the political reasoning was that up till that time, a system like Khilafa never existed. And up until that time, the only idea human beings had of running any system was kingship. And Amr bin As and Muawiyah felt that the only way we can move forward from here on is on the basis of being a dynasty. This will give us a family, because Quraysh was a strong family, and now they were even stronger than before. And so now we will have a dynasty from which this uh, history of Muslims will continue. But that was the end of Islam, normative historical Islam. Now, what happened when this happened? Muawiyah radiallahu an appointed Yazid as the Khalifa 10 years before he passed away. Sorry, five years before he passed away. All of the great companions of the Prophet at that time opposed it, but they didn't make it into a law and order situation. Ibn Abbas was against it. Ibn Umar was against it. The son of uh, Abu Bakr, Abdul Rahman, I think his name is, was against it. The son of Abdul, uh, Abu Bakr was against it. The grandson of Abu Bakr was against it. And the grandson of Prophet Muhammad was also They all voiced their opinion. This is wrong. This should not happen. But because there had been civil wars amongst Muslims, they didn't want to create a law and order situation. They wanted to wait out and see what would happen. The five years pass, Muawiyah passes away, and his son Yazid becomes the Khalifa. One point here, Sheikh, the primary difference between Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhuma becoming the Khalifa and Yazid becoming the Khalifa is that Hazrat Ali karramallahu wajhul kareem never nominated his son himself. That's like right. you yourself said. He was chosen by the Shura, by the Amruhum Shura Bainahum. Whereas this totally changes in the in the in the case of Yazid, like you say, five years before passing away, Hazrat Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he nominates his son himself. And the Shura is against it. <laughs> I mean, the irony of the matter is that everyone worth um you know, uh, with with attributes of the Sahabiyat, that the Jalilul Qadr Sahaba, everyone worth a name in the history of Islam is against it, and he still becomes the Khalifa. That is the main problem. That is the problem, and he was a cruel person on top of that. And it was kingship in its truest sense. Truest sense, hereditary kingship. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Now, when Muawiyah dies, now what happens? Ibn Umar and Ibn Abbas, they say, well, we don't want to create a law and order situation. It's already been so hard on the Muslims. So that was their ijtihad. The son of Abu Bakr had, at that time, uh, had passed away. That left two people, Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, and the grandson of Abu Bakr. So just as Abu, ba Abu Bakr and the Prophet were alone in the cave, here came a situation in Mecca where the grandson of Abd Abdullah bin Zubair and Hussein are again alone together in Mecca. And they both decide, no, we're going to oppose this. We don't want the system of Islam to change into kingship. This is not acceptable. And just like Abu Bakr said, will you change Islam while I'm alive? Hussein and, 
and of course the grandson of Abdullah bin Abdullah bin Zubair is, you know, uh, this he's the firstborn of Medina. He's the first child. By the way, talking about magic, the Jews had said that Mus that they had done magic in Medina that Muslims would not have any boys. So the first boy child in Medina was the grandson of Abu Bakr. And, you know, it was a big deal. And he was very close to the Prophet. And, of course, Hassan, <laughs> Hussein, Abdullah bin Zubair, these all grew up together. These were little boys, and now they're like men, you know. And so Abdullah bin Zubair became the Khalifa in opposition to Yazid. He took Bayah. And they gave him by Hussein. Hussein already knew his father was killed. Then he saw his brother being killed. But once Hussein, to make a long story short, started to see letters are coming to him from Kufa where his dad was. That's the reason he want, he was willing to go to Kufa. Because he felt he'll get a stronger support in Kufa than he will in Mecca. Everyone was telling Hussein, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Ibn Umar said it to him. Abdullah bin Zubair himself was a great faqih, actually. He was a great alim of the deen. And uh, he was saying also, please, till the last moment, till the moment that the family had come together, almost 120 some people, until the whole family had come together and they were ready to just leave Mecca, and wanted to create an alternative base in Kufa to oppose Yazid and to re-establish, you can say, Islam. He was with Abdullah bin Zubair. But he felt that Kufa is a better option. Why he felt that way? Because he sent his representative, Muslim bin Aqil, to go there. Muslim bin Aqil said, this whole city, Kufa. And remember, Kufa is a garrison city. It's a military city. Not like Mecca, meaning that's where, that's the military city, okay? People there know how to fight. And so he, and he, so he's like, I'm going to Kufa. And they, the companions of the Prophet tried to stop him, but of course, this is Hussein. He's going to do what he's going to do. And so the tragedy was, this was the last, Abdullah bin Zubayr, and Hussein. By the way, fast forwarding, they were both killed in the end. Abdullah bin Zubair was killed and Hussein was killed. The grandson of the Prophet and the grandson of Abu Bakr, anhuma, right? So now Hussein, this is the last stand. You know, you can say the last stand for Islam. And even though they didn't succeed, but it left for anyone who knows the Muslim history a, a mark in history, a symbol of at any cost, right? Uh, fight to the end at any cost. And so Hussein radiallahu anh goes. And uh, interestingly enough, people at that time had also gone for hajj. Just like at Uthman's time that we discussed. So now Hussein goes after receiving the letters, but then on the way, Hussein receives the message that they'd killed Muslim bin Aqil. And they could have turned back, but they didn't. Because Faiza Azamta Fatawakkal al Allah, when you have decided, then you have to trust Allah. And so they went and they took a last stand. And Again, just like Uthman, water was stopped uh, from the same well that Uthman had bought. They stopped that well on him. And so they stopped the water on Hussein, killed his family one by one. And, uh, you know, H Hussein is saying, what are you guys doing? These are your letters that you sent me. These are your letters, your letters. Oh, such and such person. Isn't this your letter to me? That today you've turned against me. This was your letter to me to come here and I, you will support. We will support you. And such and such in the army, he was showing them the letters. This is the reason I was saying that they had to even burn the, the, the tents 
because they needed to get rid of this evidence. So I'll let you say something at this point, maybe. Sheikh, it's um, the, the ayah of the Quran. Ya ayatuhan nafsul mutma'inna irji'i la rabbiki radiyatan martiyya. Many of my teachers are of the opinion that it is about Hussein, radiyallahu anhu. One can agree to it, one can disagree to it. But the point is, like you said, Faiza. But it was Azam true for Hussein regardless. True for Hussein, absolutely. Like you said, Ya Sheikh, um, Faiza Azamta, Fatawakkal ala Allah. Inna ladina qalu rabbuna Allahu thumma staqamu tatanazzalu alayhimu al malaika. And so the tragedy of Imamina wa Sayyidina wa Sanadina Hussein radiallahu anhu is really a tragedy from which we can learn a lot. It is the last stand. And subhanallah, if you look at it, uh, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, he saw in his dream that he was killing his own son. He was sacrificing his own son. And Allah subhanallah, when Ismail alayhi salam, he heard this, he said, uh, you know, oh father, do as you were decreed to do. Yeah. And Allah said that this was the bala, this was the um, test. And he substituted Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam with a goat. Yeah. Here you see the son of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet used to say, and again, this is a Sahih Hadith. I'm not quoting any Da'if or Madhu Hadith because there are a lot of them when it comes to this subject. It says, Ana min Hussein wal Hussein minni. I am from Hussein and Hussein is from me. Man ahabba huma, whomsoever <laughs> loved Hassan and Hussein, he loves me. Wa man abgada huma fa abgadani. kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam. These are Sahih prophetic traditions and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam loved them so much so much there are so many prophetic traditions in which while the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was praying they would come and sit on his back and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would, would actually prolong his prayer let them play on his back subhanallah they would uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would kiss their cheeks their heads and even in some prophetic tradition, it is said that uh, traditions, it is said that uh, uh, Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu was similar to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from Amblicus downwards and Hazrat Hassan radiallahu anhu was similar to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from Amblicus upward. If I'm not mistaken, Sheikh, right? That is how. <laughs> yeah, so subhanallah, yani, where sh where would I begin and where I would end the muhabba, the love that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for these two princes, subhanAllah. And both of them murdered. Both of both them, of murdered. them yeah. murdered. And may Allah increase our love for them. And Amen. loving them is one of the symbols of what it means to stand up against a tyrant. Exactly. Exactly. The and one, and I, this, you know, I'm not talking about Shiaism. I'm talking no. about mainstream Sunni thought, right? That to us, we love Hassan and Hussein more, in a sense, for us, just like we love Musa more, right? So this, uh, the, this, this, the timing of their death being in Muharram and Muharram being Ashura and Ashura being the that liberation from Fir'aun right the, the celebration this was the point I was making Sheikh that the sacrifice we can trace it back to uh, to uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam when and the, Allah... narration the prophet knew right I'm sure you can probably speak yes. on that more than I can uh, no Sheikh you can always speak on all the subjects more than me, please don't say that. I <laughs> May Allah give but all yes, of us sir. the haya of Uthman. Ameen, ameen. La, ya Sheikh, wallahi billahi astahi minnak, inshallah. <laughs> no, you're very right. We're right. You're very right, Sheikh. Uh, absolutely, please continue. 
So uh, the Prophet was also told that his sons, meaning Hassan, uh, Hussein, uh, or Hassan and Hussein, that they would be killed. And uh, the the hadith that he brought this uh, 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 the sand and gave it to one of his uh, wives, Um Um Salma, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, and said, "Oh Um Salma, keep looking at this sand. The day it turns red, know that my son has was murdered in Karbala." So absolutely, he knew about this. He knew about the sacrifice. But again, that concept of nafsul mutma'inna, that the anbiya possess, and they're all possess, that amanna wa sadaqna. Oh Allah, if this is written for me, bismillah, yalla, bismillah, let's do it. There is no fear in them. This is the last dance of khilafah. This becomes important because standing in front of tyrant is not just about your own life. It is also about the lives of your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren, the wives of your grandchildren. I mean, look at Karbala, ya Sheikh. The whole family was slaughtered. Even the child, even the child. Yeah. So standing in front of the tyrant, Afdalul Jihad, right? Afdalul Jihad. Standing in front of the tyrant is not easy. It's not just, I mean, people like us, Sheikh, you and me, I mean, let's let's frankly talk about this. You're afraid of dying? Are you? Sometimes. I mean, wallahi. But, I mean, generally speaking, you're not afraid of death. I don't see it in your eyes. <laughs> right? I'm not afraid of dying. But when it would come to our children... Let's say this, that I know I'm going to die. And I've come to accept that yeah. as a fact. Exactly. And that reality as a fact is scary, not because I'm going to die. But it is scary because of, number one, the process of dying. Like, I worry about, like, if I'm going to die... Is it going to be a bomb or am I going to have a janaza? <laughs> like, uh, you know, Allah if, if I'm going to die, you know, <laughs> is, is you know, my wasiya going to be, you know, like, where will I be buried? Will it be here or there? You know, these are, anyway, so. Allah, ya Shaykh, Allah, inshallah, Allah will do what is best for you, inshallah. But the point I was making, Shaykh, was psychologically speaking, how many Muslims, I mean, I see this in, in Muslims, alhamdulillah, one thing that I see in Muslims, like you said, they're not afraid of dying, they know they're going to die, right? They're going to die, that's fine. It's, it's death, it's going to come. But when it comes to the children, to the progeny, to your wife, to your child, to the wives of your children, you would be afraid. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, oh my God. Nothing should harm them. Nothing should, you know, just because of me, because I have made a decision, no harm should come to them. This is the real sacrifice. Actually, that's very that, interesting you say that because Zainul Abidin, after they were all killed, and Zainul Abidin was sick, and they decided at one point to kill him too. He said, okay, fine, you can kill me, but what are you going to do with the women of the Prophet? That was his You know, my, my sisters and my, uh, my, um, my aunts, aunts. My children, what are you going to do with them? And that led to a discussion where they let him go. But he was in that Karbala and he was the only man saved was Zainul yes. Abidin, uh, <clears throat> the son of Hussein. Uh, Allah so mashallah, mashallah, he was at the topmost level of nafs, the nafsul mutmainna. Yeah. He showed us with a practical example, not just words written in any book, not just theories discussed amongst the scholastics, amongst the scholars, amongst the academics, not just discussions happening in universities with the students, not just discussions happening like the one we are having right now, ya Sheikh, mm -hmm. or the TV talk shows. No, no. Yeah. He showed us. He said and, and, everything. And that's for so Islam. important. That's so important because being with the pious people leaves a mark on a person that no book can teach. Right? Absolutely. Wallahi, ya Sheikh, I'll tell you this. Wallahi, I want to share this. No matter how much I think of myself in my psyche that I'm a brave man. I have I have a muscular body. I'm very brave. I'm psychologically brave. My heart is, alhamdulillah, functioning well. When it comes to my children, I am a coward. 
I am the worst of the cowards, Ya Sheikh. Wallahi <laughs> billahi. Well, that's what I the can... Prophet said. <laughs> I mean, uh, subhanallah, I look at Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhuma. I look at Ali, karramallahu ajhul kareem. I mean, subhanallah. That's another level, Ya Sheikh. That is another level. If you want to look at the truest form of sacrifice, subhanallah, his children getting slaughtered in front of his eyes, his, his family suffering. Yes. And he's saying, and he did he say anything? Did he complain? No. no. He said, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. That's just the point I wanted to they, make. Yes. But no matter what, it they were not willing to not take the last stand. They had to yes. take the last stand. They were compelled. Yes. And this is how important the Khilafah is. Yes. People don't realize this. This People is... want to cry about Hussein and the whole exactly. tragedy and the mourning and how bad Yazid was and all of but, that. They'll but do that, that is also Sunnah. Crying for Hussein is also Sunnah. No, yes, yes, absolutely. Actually, I have a poem on that. Yes. Uh, yes. Al uh, uh, oh, subhanallah. Subhan you wrote that poem yourself? No, no, no. One of the students of Shaul. Right, right. Oh, okay. Haqqul yes. Baqa yes. al amwat uh, saadat That it is the right of the pious that we cry over them. We cry over them. And absolutely, the minute but, you stop crying over them, you have lost spiritual contact. But I absolutely understand you know, the like, point you are making. I'm you sorry, an I cut example, you. Like, I've seen like my teachers, they always refer to their teachers in their talks, even after 20, 30, 40 years, they'll say, my teacher is such and such. My, yes. Because those memories are etched, those feelings are etched, and they bring their loss brings tears. Absolutely. And yes. you know, for example, we'll bring up Dark Sub together, right? Dr. Sub. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So it's, it's... We always feel that in the heart, you know, somebody that was dear to us, you know, he's no more, we can't really go to him and talk to him. And, and... you can't get that from books. Absolutely, you, you can. can't get that from books. That feeling, that memory, that uh, uh, that spiritual connection, right? And but anyway, the point I'm trying to make. Yes, is, I'm sorry, I cut you off there, Sheikh. No, 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 I, no, I, I no, totally no. understand the point that you were making. Absolutely, please continue. Yes. So, <clears throat> the uh, khilafa importance of khilafa. Yeah, I mean, people will make a big drama. A humble jumble of emotions. But they don't care if the Sharia is being broken right in front of their houses. Or if their country is breaking the Sharia. For that thing that which Hussein died for. They're not worried about that. That injustice that he died for. They're not worried about that. That the, the, the structure, the building that the Prophet left. So the it has been now broken piece by piece. You only don't even see ruins now. Maybe in the 90s we saw ruins. Now it's even worse than that. So now you, you, we don't stand up for, you know, first at least they were crying over that. Now we don't even cry over it in the real sense of the word. I'm yes. talking specifically about the Sunni world now. Because, okay, the Shia, they cry every 10th of Muharram and so on and so forth. But even that, it's empty cries. It's empty slogans. It, it's a ritual. It's a ritual. Azan Exactly. The, what did he stand up for? What did he give his life for? And where are you in that mission? Right? Where are you in that mission? And so that is the feeling, the feeling of that mission that he, you know, where just as he felt compelled that I have to do this no matter what, at what cost. Yes. You should maybe feel 1% of that, half a percent of that, a quarter percent of that, that you have to also stand up and do something for Islam, to rebuild Islam, to bring Islam back, to bring the Khilafah back. Anyway, so now... Uh, might I add just one thing, yeah, uh, yeah. Sheikh, just for the viewers, especially for the young ones listening? Islam and Khilafah, they are like this. They are yes. inseparable. So when we say Khilafah, we mean Islam. When we say Islam, we mean Khilafah because Islam is manifested in practical terms through Khilafah and Khilafah alone. That's what right. the Sheikh it, is saying. 
it's not just a religion. It has its own economic, political, judicial, educational, moral system. Yes. Spiritual system. It's like the whole, that environment, that society, that civilization, which then was Khilafa and then it became kingship for a yes. long time. And then you had the Umayyad and the Abbasids and the mm -hmm. Ottomans and the Mughals. That's not Islam. And it's very important for the youth to know this, that that is not Islam. It's not just Sharia because mostly youth hear this, hears this word Sharia and they think, oh, whenever the West talks about oh, the system of Sharia, they mean Islam. No, it is a misconception. Sharia is just the law part, the ta'zirat yes. uh, for the jara'im. That is just the law and jurisprudence part. That's not Islam. That is not Islam. Islam is khilafah in which a tiny part has to do with the judicial system. Yes. And uh, this is a civilization that has its own paradigms, you know. And and so I'll just moving forward. After Hussein radiallahu anh is killed, then Hijaj bin Yusuf comes and attacks Mecca, uh, and uh, kills uh, the grandson of Abu Bakr. And his mother was alive, and she saw him hanging. She was a hundred years old. Yes, and. And again, look at this, just as the courage that Hussein showed Abdullah bin Zubair, his mother said, why are you wearing the armor? Yes, subhanAllah. Why are you wearing the armor? If you're going to fight today, because they knew what's coming. If you're going to fight yes. today, fight without the armor. The mother saying this to the child. And so that was the last stance. And, and there was a time where Abdullah bin Zubair was gaining uh, gaining power but then it came and they killed the companions of the Prophet wasallam, and that was end of Islam proper basically between Hassan between Hussein and, and, and oh, Abdullah yeah. bin Zubair yeah. after that there were many movements from the family of the Prophet specifically like Nafsu Zakiya who stood up against the Umayyads and the Abbasids but then that slowly also gave away. Now, how does this relate to the future, the Mahdi? One way, you know the hadith that you mentioned, uh, 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 alaykum sunnati wa sunnatul khulafa al rashidin al mahdiyin al -Mahdiyin. So this Mahdi, the word itself is connected with the word khilafa, if you take hadith to hadith. And so the Mahdi will be another man in the family of the Prophet Sallallahu who will manifest a new stand. There may be stands before him that will lead up to this new, new you can say, another, I don't know, final stand, but on the other side of re-bringing everything back. Right? So what is the things that have to happen is that we have to re-talk about Khilafah, re-imagine Khilafah, re-dream Khilafah. That will actually manifest this in the real world faster. Do dua for Khilafah. So Mahdi and, the, and by the way, the Prophet used the word Mahdi for Hassan and Hussein. I think he used it for the, uh, Hassan. Yes. The word yes, Mahdi was used for Hassan also. And the word Mahdi is used also for his great grandson, the Mahdi. And what did the Mahdi do? Meaning Hassan, he he established, re, tried to repair the building of Khilafa to bring back the unity. Okay. And what will the Mahdi do? The one who's going to come, he's going to help Muslims re-establish that justice. The Prophet said that he will establish Salam justice Allah. just as much as there was injustice before it. And with him will come a prophet, meaning the prophet. Are you Isa, Isa. Isa. Yes. And Sheikh, you want to talk here about what we were talking about before? Yeah. Uh, Bismillah, this... you do that. Bismillah. Uh, it is important, and at least to my understanding, and obviously my understanding is not perfect, it's flawed, but this could, this could be one of the angles that we can look at, is that the perfect system was established when we had in person the chosen one, meaning 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, khatib al-anbiya. He established the perfect system. After his death, the system only lasted for 30 or so years. And so what does that tell, tell us? It tells us that for the sustainability of an enlightened system, of a spiritual system, system that is based on the spirituality of Islam, the Khilafah, you need a chosen one. You need a Nabi, a Rasul, or somebody at the same status in a physical manifestation between the Muslimin. Because in the Quran, and that is to the best of my understanding, in Quran, when Allah tells us what is the purpose of the Prophet wasallam, he begins with the concept of tazkiyah. You zakki him wa you alimuhum. The Mufassirin say that wow is jazaiya here. You zakki him and then يعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة. So the first thing is tazkiyah. Now you can take it as you like, in, in whichever meaning you like. If you're a Sufi, you will take it as tazkiyah to nafs. If you're not a Sufi, you'll at least take it in the terms of tarbiyah. That there is something that the Prophet does and then teaches them, then makes them, uh, brings them at a level where they could understand the kitab and hikmah. And it is very pertinent to note that the first perfect system of Islam was established when the Nabi was in us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was in his physical existence manifestation between the Muslimin. And Bada al-Islam gariban wa sayaudu gariba. And in the end of times, the Islam will return to its original form. After there will be another Rasul, another Nabi in us. I mean, the status of Isa yes, Isa would Isa. still remain. Yeah, yes. would still remain as 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 a Rasul, yeah, but he will. Yeah. In Rasulullah, but he will be uh, representing the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. However, his status would remain, and so it is pertinent to note that you need. That presence, that that is why the idea of Mehdi is so <laughs> important. It's so important because without Mehdi, and Muslims have been trying for centuries now, for centuries. I mean, how many? 13, 13 and a half centuries now. But you don't see even, you know, in its remotest, in its remotest essence, the Khilafah anywhere in the world. Anywhere. Like you yeah, said. Uh, she, there she were some even... attempts yeah. after the Prophet, like Omar bin Abdul Aziz or uh, Salahuddin Ayyubi or Nuruddin Zangi Aranzeb. Yes. These were like attempts that came pretty close. And even they didn't last, right? They didn't last. They didn't last. So you need that personage. That is why Mahdi alayhi salam is important. That is why the second coming of Isa alayhi salam is important. It is logical. Even if somebody somebody even like me who's not well read into eschatology this is one plus one two this is logical mm, mashallah okay and so i also want to emphasize here is that there is a, a you could say a large uh not group but a large there there is kind of like you could say uh, trying to ignore the legacy of hussein in the Muslim world, and partly because the kings of the Muslim world, right, MBS and the others, they don't want Muslims to realize that there was a companion of the Prophet who stood up against yes. kingship. Yes. There was a companion of the Prophet who stood up against uh, a tyrant. They don't want that Islam. They want that Islam that is, oh, you do your hajj, you do your fasting, you do your salah, but don't talk about issues of justice, right? They don't Absolutely. want that Islam that has to do with the system. And so this is why Hussein is so important. And this is exactly why the Mahdi is so important because they symbolize a stand against tyranny, a stand against falsehood. So inshallah ta'ala, I think we will end on that for today. Uh, yeah. Any final statements? Final yes, Sheikh, you, uh, yeah, I just want to add very quickly that they are taking the the name of Islam, but actually what they are doing is they are they are 
bringing the Muslims farther and farther away from the real spirit of Islam. When you see Maulana's, I mean, I'm sorry, I have to use this word, but Maulana's with, with long beards and big imamas, and they sit there and they talk about the ayah of the Quran, wa ulil amri minkum. And then they interpret that's the regime, that's the ruler yeah, that's of right. the land, right? I mean, yeah, inna lillahi, yeah. inna lillahi, yeah, wa inna no matter how cruel Hiraj. he is, he's ulul amr. Yeah, he's What's ulul amr. Yeah. Exactly. And saying, and like we talked about, ya Sheikh, yahdi bihi kathiram wa yudillu bihi kathira. People will always use Quran and Hadith for their own purposes, for their own purposes. So. In, in Urdu, uh, if you allow me, there is this couplet that Islam is alive after every time. Islam is reborn after every Karbala. Shah Ast Hussain, Bad Shah Ast Hussain, Deen Ast Hussain, Deen Panah Ast Hussain. Mm -hmm. So all these couplets say that Hazrat Imam Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he revived Islam. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean in simpler terms for the youth of today? What it means is that the real true spirit of Islam is not just sitting at home and doing tasbih or just going and pray for, praying five times, although that's important, but just going to mosques and doing hajj and zakat. and ritual. It's not just the name of rituals. It Without is the justice aspect, everything is lost. Adal awesome. is the main, you know, Shahid Allah, Annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikata wa ulul ilm qa'iman bil qist. Bil qist. Yes. Qist comes first. Yes. And, 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 you know, the, the without justice, all piety is useless. It Absolutely. becomes impious virtuousness. Absolutely. It's like the person who says, uh, you know, let me help you because you have AIDS. But I will never tell you that it's the lifestyle of AIDS is bad for you. I'll help you because you have AIDS, but I'm never going to tell you all that that lifestyle is itself unjust. This is where what Muslims are doing. The Hussein radiallahu anh stands the for Allah. that that central aspect of justice which is not emphasized enough uh, within the the current Muslim world the idea of justice within Islam they want you to know about the ritualistic aspects some intellectual yes. aspects you know but the justice aspect the social justice this is uh, this is lost you know and it's because really then they won't be able to make any more money, a sheikh. Like you, <laughs> you have you have a lot of lectures on that. I mean, what would happen to those nine banks, the whole capitalist regime, the millions, billions of dollars and in, in reserves, and you know, it's it's a big threat to them. Mm -hmm. And that is why they fuel this system of the Maulanas of the clergy talking about Ulil Amri Minkum and saying, Oh no, 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 just go and pray. Just do subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. That's it. That's Islam. Just before sleeping, say, uh, Bismillahi, Allahumma bismika mutu ahya. And that is the Islam. And so you're very right there, Sheikh. Yeah. You know, it's it's not the minimalist approach because the minimalist approach is, oh, at least we can do this. At least we could pray five times a day. At least we have freedom to do this. At least we can do this. The Mahdi, when he stands up, he's not taking a minimalist approach. He's like, I want it all, meaning the whole That's of Islam. It's all or none. I want to work for the whole of Islam. I'm not going to be contented that I'm just doing a portion ibadah to Allah. Either I'm going to fight to, to bring it all, or I'm going to die fighting to bring it all, meaning the whole system. And so th this is, you know, the Mahdi could also be minimalist like many people will be at that time but he will choose but, not to be a minimalist right. and what is that part what does it mean not to be minimalist it it really starts with the idea of justice like the prophet did but why do you yes. kill this child baby that is the voice arabia needed to hear like wow that that makes sense we shouldn't kill our babies you know and if you take the minimalist approach, well, let me just, you know, keep it easy for people or yeah. it has to be the middle radical way. Anyway, uh, 
again, I'll ask you any final words before we end. Jazakallah khair, ya Sheikh. This was uh, uh, really food for thought and food food for spirit. I mean, I really feel like I'm really energized from within. Wallahi, I'm saying this honestly, because talking about these things, and this is what, what I tell my students as well and my youth as well, when you talk about these kinds of sacrifices in Islam and these kinds of aspects of Islam, it should energize you from within. You should feel that energy, that spiritual energy and psychic energy. And this is what it is about. Exert this into righteousness, into doing right stuff, and inshallah, Allah will help you and Allah help us all. Sakallah. Allahumma ameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.